After they were all fairly well disposed of the Buford charge, in the Buford charge they were dressed in strains of thrilling eloquence by their gallant deliverer, to which they responded in a song, There is a white robe for thee. A song so appropriate and so heartfelt and cordial as to bring unbidden tears. The colonel was followed by a speech from the black woman who led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. For sound sense and real native eloquence, her address would do honor to any man and it created a great sensation. Since the rebellion, she had devoted herself to her great work of delivering the bondmen, that's slaves, with an energy and sagacity that cannot be exceeded. Many and many times she has penetrated the enemy's lines and discovered their situation and condition and escaped without injury, but not without extreme hazard. The Combahee River, it was in South Carolina, first one visited by the Spaniards in the year 1520. Vasca de Ayon, having discovered it, discovered it, aha, uh -huh, named it the River Jordan. Although subsequently named the Combahee, the stream now became a river, Jordan literally for more than several hundred and fifty Negroes, who under the leadership of Harriet Tubman and the auxiliary command of Colonel James Montgomery, delivered this number of blacks to the free line, into the free lines. The River Jordan has been in biblical history a reality and in modern Negro illusions a symbol of the barrier between bondage and freedom. And it's an interesting coincidence, therefore, that the Combahee campaign should be so parallel the ancient situation. It's significant as the only military engagement in American history wherein a woman, black or white, led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. New York Tribune said the Negro troops at Hilton Head will soon start an expedition under the command of Colonel Montgomery, differing in many respects from heretofore projected. The Combahee strategy was formulated by Harriet Tubman as an outcome of her penetration to the enemy lines and her belief that the Combahee River countryside was ripe for a successful invasion. She was asked by General Hunter if she would go with several gunboats up the Combahee River, the object of the expedition to take up the torpedoes placed by the rebels in the river to destroy railroads and bridges and to cut off supplies from the rebel troops. She said she would go if Colonel Montgomery was appointed commander of the expedition. Accordingly, Colonel Montgomery was appointed to the command and Harriet with several men under the principal who, of whom was J. Plowden accompanied the expedition. So actually, in this raid, it was Montgomery who was the auxiliary leader. The whole venture owed its success to the complete preliminary survey made by Harriet Tubman, Harry Tubman's espionage troops. Montgomery was chosen because he participated with John Brown on the raid of Harper's Ferry by Harriet. Not, no, Harriet didn't make the raid. John Brown made the raid. Colonel Montgomery was with him. That's why he was picked. Because why would you pick a particular Union Army, uh, Union Army colonel? Cap Captain Lay, the Confederate investigating officer, discussing the, discussing the movement afterwards said, the enemy seems to have been well posted as to the character and capacity of our troops and their small chance of encountering opposition and to have been well guided by persons thoroughly acquainted with the river and country. It was a commentary, however indirect, on Harriet's work and the labor of her subordinates. About 10 miles north of Point Royal, Harriet's station was St. Helena Island, and between this island and the mainland of South Carolina was the water known as St. Helena Sound. The Combahee River, a narrow, jagged stream that ran about 50 miles into the interior of the state, began to the sound, and on its banks were rice fields and marshes. During the night, Harriet and Colonel Montgomery, with a party of about 150 Negro troops and three gunboats, started up the Combahee River. Pickets, located at stations near the mouth of the stream, spotted the oncoming boats and dispatched word to the Confederates. Late, located deeper inland at Green Pond, every plantation on both sides of the river was aroused. The Union soldiers' small detachment raced from one to another, creating a de general devastation of the zone. The Combahee Ferry region, the Blake, Lowndes, Middleton, and Hayward plantations were in ruins. The Negroes fled to the, gun, fled to the gunboats, and the slave masters skedaddled inland. 
The bridge at Kombayi Ferry was burning, but not too badly. As the gunboats passed up the river, the Negroes left their work and took to the woods, for at first they were frightened. Then they came out to peer like startled deer, but scudding away like the wind at the sound of the steam whistle on the gunboats. The word was passed along that these were Lincoln's gunboats come to set them free. From that moment on, the overseers used their whips in vain for the failed, they failed to drive the slaves back to the quarters. They turned and ran for the gunboats, the slaves. They came down every road across every field, dressed just as they were when they left their work and their cabins. There were women with children clinging about their necks, hanging on to their dresses or running behind, but all rushed at full speed for Lincoln's gunboats. Hundreds crowded the banks with their hands extended towards the deliverers, and most of them were taken aboard the gunboats to be carried to Beaufort. Or Beaufort. This is about what happened all through the night and morning of June 2nd when Harriet Montgomery and the colored soldiers overran the Combayi. So looking over uh, the last few elections, last three elections, uh, if you notice, slave states, red states are pro, pro, largely pro-slavery states in the sense that this is where slavery existed. The Nebraska Territory and Utah and uh, the New Mexico Territory were uh, open to slavery, but not overtly slave states. What happened to the map that I put in here? I flew that in. Oh, I bet I know. Still not working? Oh, I had a great map here. Oh well. Yeah, it's here. Where is it? There. Tisk tisk. Pieces. All right. Be that way. So, the Confederacy is not dead. The Confederate battle flag is a potent symbol of both white supremacy and white supremacist movements. While masquerading as a simple nostalgic movement, it actually provides cover for a number of like organizations, including the NRA, uh, which my parents referred to as the Negro Removal Association, or National Rifle Association, the Ku Klux Klan, American Nazis, Skinheads, Christian Identity, European Kindred, and other similar movements. So basically, the Confederates believe, in terms of God and country, that America is a white Protestant King James version of the Bible-based traditional family values country, um, which also uh, suffered when basically others started getting included into the citizenry. So it also tends to be uh, what you also often see is uh, white separatist movements as part of this. So uh, Google search, and I'm not sure why my the computer, the PC refused to show images of uh, the last two election results. Theoretically, computers can't be racist, but it will show <laughs> the Confederate stuff. Hmm. So, patriotism. Uh, this is from a Confederate website, actuated by a love of one's country. And so, these states uh, within it were the part of the original Confederacy. In case you didn't remember the symbolism of the flag, so 13 stripes, 
symbolizing the original 13 colonies and uh, then a star added for each state from 13 colonies to one nation and the Confederate battle flag 13 states by 13 colonies but obviously beyond the original 13 colonies. So the idea being we're a separate country or the seeds of a separate, separatist country. So overlay one nation on the other. What comes through? Gradually, the obvious Confederate imagery begins to fade away. The animations don't come through on a PC. Mm -hmm. So, who is, who is a patriot? So, I actually Googled image on who was a patriot. And I got these classic Norman Rockwell-like images of patriotism. And you can see who's in them and who's not in them. Confederate American. Hmm. So, heritage, not hate. So, the question could become, in terms of looking at the meme, Confederate American, what would that heritage be? Because that's often an argument they'll use in terms of looking at the, you know, why can't, they, why can't I display the Confederate flag? This is heritage, not hate. So, is that nation based on equality and the right to vote even for black confederates and there are black confederates remember honor black confederate soldiers the south black there were confederate and black confederate soldiers in the interest of full disclosure question could be whether they were fighting for freedom were they fighting for equality or were they uppity were they uppity or did they know their place? Strangely, they don't give the answers to those questions. Nathan Bedford Forrest. So General Nathan Bedford Forrest, Confederate General at Fort Pillow. Fort Pillow was a massacre which involved black soldiers, women, children. They had all surrendered when they were surrounded by Confederate troops. They were burned, buried, al burned alive, buried alive after being burned, crucified alive after they had surrendered. And Forrest founded the Ku Klux Klan. He's also the namesake for Forrest Gump. Fort Pillow. No oh, damn man kills me in life and lives. Ride like you rode with forest. Hmm. Now what would that mean? Riding with forest, huh? Preserving your heritage is not a hate crime. Pride, not prejudice. Stop southern cultural cleansing. So with the idea, okay, southern is this is our culture. It's not pride, it's not prejudice, it's pride. So if your heritage was slave owning, what if I don't want to be a slave or for you to have slaves? Respect and honor my heritage and I'll respect and honor yours. Okay, sounds neutral. So if you note the slaves that are pictured here for in this, in this particular piece, it's not racial, it's regional. States are pictured here in the Confederacy. Part of the white supremacist movement is to claim certain areas as a whites-only homeland. Uh, Oregon is one of those places that they'd like for a whites-only homeland. So outside of the states of the Confederacy, this is usually depicted as the Northwest. Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana as a whites-only homeland. This is basically prior to the elections of 2008. Right no doubt still an interestingly held value as well. Now they're starting to add more. 
In this depiction, Arizona and New Mexico seem to have been added to the Confederacy. And what one wonders what they mean by liberty and justice for all. Cowboys have emerged as one type of white supremacist youth gang here in Oregon. The phenomenon is not just limited to Oregon, but rebel cowboys, redneck, rebel cowgirl. This term, um, cowboy, do you know where it came from? Cow hands, yeah, okay. But where? Where are they from? Originally. The Spanish, yeah. Okay. And the Spanish word is? Vaquero. Okay. Um, when we talk about Western, so there's two types of equestrians, right? Western and English. Where did the Western style come from? Well, he said it already, Mexico. But where did the Mexicans get their horses and horsemanship? Spanish. Spanish. And where did the Spanish get their horses and horsemanship? North Africa. North Africa. Hmm. So, these cattlemen, <laughs> okay, originally black Africans, and remember, you know, what we learned about Mexico Mexico elected the first black president and freed the slaves before America. They referred to themselves as vaqueros. Basically, which means cattlemen. And in English, they refer to themselves as cattlemen. But in places in the South, particularly Texas, these black cattle men were referred to by whites as cow boys. Not recognizing them as men. Boy, you think you're equal to me? So interestingly enough, the term cow boys stuck and became genericized. So now we see it as <laughs> cowboys as a mark of pride. Uh-huh. Okay. Welcome to Dixie. Don't stay long. Uh, a former Oregon governor once said, welcome to Oregon. Spend money, then leave. And in this map, the conf Confederacy seems to be expanding, too. So that's in the past, right? What, why folks often say, when you bring up the immediate, recent, or distant past to illustrate that it's still happening in the present, injustices, and that they're all in denial about because it would mean changing the status quo. So, black history is American history. So, black or African American history is American history, the principal, first, highest, or principled ethic, ethical difference is what we remember versus what they leave out. So, case in point, for example, in Eugene history. So, all bomb threats, there have been bomb threats, for example, um, to the Hulk Center, have been African-American related events. Uh, I may have commented earlier that uh, there were no black people allowed within the city limits of Eugene to live be within the city limits of Eugene before 65, unless a white person sold you the house. But it was actually illegal for a realtor to sell to you before 1965, hence no ethnic neighborhoods. But bomb threats. <clears throat> The Hulk Center have been African-American related events. I've been present actually at all of them, where uh, 
particularly where the crowd was evacuated. First event was in 85, a benefit for Oxfam America for famine relief in Ethiopia. It was a phone-in pledge with uh, live music. This was uh, basically three weeks before the Michael Jackson uh, composition, uh, We Are the World, got released. So basically that was to raise money for the same purpose. This um, event, uh, Arzenia Richardson, who used to work for KLCC uh, running the jazz show, he took the phone call in which a caller said he had placed a bomb because, quote, he didn't like the fact that they were raising money for niggers in Africa, unquote. Arzenia reported that, quote, verbatim to the register guard, which said, The bomber was concerned the event wasn't raising money for Oregon children. Uh, right. <laughs> A lie, essentially. Carl didn't even mention Oregon children, and so why not simply report the facts as reported? Was in the surprise that race is an issue to local citizens still. And if you're surprised that your local newspaper lies with race is concerned, who's going to tell you the truth? So no reporter of color actually has even lasted at the Register Guard longer than three to five years. And that five-year record being a Native American woman. But that's the past. So, Barack Obama has expressed admiration for Abraham Lincoln, particularly in his team of rival selection of foreign, uh, former adversaries as advisors. Pundits have touted his election, the first election, as the beginning of a post-racial era beyond black power confrontational politics, and we've seen where that has gone and where that has gotten us. So, black and blue, the black, blue, and gray, the Civil War, nobody knows, is from um, one of the original books that built this class, the, um, before the Mayflower, Lerone Bennett. So, 62... Uh, August 14th, 1862, Lincoln handpicks a group of five free blacks, the first major conference of uh, black Americans with an American president. Lincoln told the men it was their duty to leave America. Now, I wonder if that's going to be in the Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> but you and we are of different races, have between us a broader difference than exists between almost any two races. Whether it is right or wrong, I need not discuss. But this physical difference is a great disadvantage to, you, to us both, as I think your race suffers very greatly, many of them by living among us, while ours suffers from your presence. Ow. In Lincoln's view, white people didn't want black people in America, and therefore black people would have to go. He proposed black settling in Central America, Costa Rica, a land rich in coal. He asked his visitors, Frederick Douglass among them, to help him find black settlers capable of thinking as white men. Free blacks organized protests and sent letters and petitions to the White House. So, yeah, living and thinking as white men, what would that mean? Hmm, let's see, Costa Rica, rich in coal and surfing? Is that what it means to think like a white man? Uh, pretty flowers and butterflies with clear wings? What, what? Mangoes, year-round growing, what? How, what are we supposed to think about here? A horse thief pleading for the existence of the horse, pleading that the existence of a horse is the apology for his theft, or highwaymen contending that the money in the traveler's pockets is the sole first cause of his robbery are about as entitled to respect as the president's reasoning at this point. That's Frederick, obviously. No, Mr. President. It is not the innocent horse that makes the horse thief, nor the traveler's purse that makes the highway robber, 
and is not the presence of the Negro that causes this foul and unnatural war, but the cruel and br brutal cupidity. Cupidity is defined in the dictionary. Cupid, greed, especially for money or possessions. The brutal cupid cupidity of those who wish to possess horses, money,